Welcome to this October edition of the Wild Bearings webcast series, the seventh in a series of eight webcasts in 2021, where we discuss interesting locations, watersheds, topics, and in some cases, even people along the 469 miles of the Blue Ridge Parkway. In this edition, we'll be talking with Mark H. Woods, the retired superintendent of the Blue Ridge Parkway, about his lifetime of ins insights and experiences along the parkway. For more on future editions or to access recordings of this and other editions, visit www.wildbearings.com. Hello, everyone. My name is Sam Johnson one of your co-hosts tonight, and I'm going to be joined by my best friend, Wild Bearings business partner and fly fishing buddy, Chris the Trout Assassin Sloan. Chris, I'm glad you finally made it. Uh, it rained all day today. Were you fishing or what? I wish so, but no, water, water's up. It's a little, I have like a 50 degree uh, meter, you know, if it's below 50, I kind of get, I kind of get a little wimpy. So yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. But this weekend, I'm thinking, I'm thinking we may get out. And of course, the most important face you see here that is that of Mr. Park Range Superintendent Extraordinaire himself, Mark Woods. Welcome, Mark. It's great to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Sam and Chris. It's good to be with you all as well. Well, we've been, uh, Mark, Chris and I have really been looking forward to this one. Um, we were, you know, we've been talking about it a long time, and we're just glad you were able to uh, take time out of your schedule to be with us. It's great, great to join you tonight. Hey, before we before we get started, uh, we're going to be talking a lot more about Mark in just a few minutes. Um, but first, I, let's say a, a couple of words about our sponsors who are helping make this webcast possible. Chris? Yeah, uh, Sam. So uh, obviously one of our key sponsors is uh, Hunter Banks Fly Fishing in Asheville. Uh, been around since 1985, uh, a leading full service uh, fly fishing outfitter in the region. Uh, missions remain true from the start. Foster the fly fishing community in Asheville and the surrounding communities of Western North Carolina. Uh, two main passions that drive their mission. Uh, offer products to equip fly fishing community with the best fly fishing gear available and provide the most experienced guide services to ensure a great day on the water. Uh, founder and owner Frank Smith and his team really know the waters of North Carolina. Uh, and if you look them up, um, you know, they'll, they'll help you find some trout along the parkway. Uh, you can visit hunterbanksflyfishing.com. And I will add, uh, they have an excellent fly tying uh offering so if you're in the area drop by and uh pick up some fly tying gear good stuff also one of our sponsors is the southern highland craft guild in Asheville. Uh, as a creative community of over 900 juried artists spanning some nine appalachian states the southern highland craft guild fosters opportunities for makers to build market and maintain their creative livelihood through continuing education, retail outlets, and mentoring. The Guild has four retail locations in Western North Carolina, as well as a very robust online presence. The headquarters, the main retail location, exhibitions and galleries are located at the Folk Arts Center so on the Blue Ridge Parkway in Asheville. Executive Director Tom Bailey and his staff do a really great job of leading and managing that organization of artists. Uh, visit southernhighlandguild.org. And uh, by the way, Mark and Chris, don't hold it against the guild, but I, I'm actually a member of this crowd. They, you know, a few years ago, they were having a down year and I, I kind of skimmed in under the radar, you know, for my membership. So I'm thinking you probably saw a craft and guild and probably thought, Mm, beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's probably that's probably what did it. <laughs> hey, and finally, and finally, uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation. These guys are the primary philanthropic fundraising partner for the Parkway. They provide support for a variety of initiatives along the 469 mile route, including historical and cultural preservation 
environmental protection, vista amenities, and education and outreach. The foundation CEO, Carolyn Ward, and her staff do a really great job of collaborating and working with the Parkway superintendent and staff, uh, raising funds through individual gifts and grants and endowments and charitable uh, type trust, listening to the concerns and suggestions of the Parkway's community of stewards, partnering with other nonprofits and businesses and chambers around, around the area, and finally, awarding grants that serve the best interest of the Blue Ridge Parkway. For more information, visit BlueRidgeParkwayFoundation.org. Well, Mark and Chris, uh, you know, Chris, Chris, Mark has been really been chomping at the bit to get started here, but before we do that, do you want to say a couple of words about housekeeping? Yeah, we, we've muted everybody's microphone so uh, we can get through this. Um, there was a chat feature at the bottom. You can ask questions. Uh, we'll answer those at the end of the presentation. Uh, and, um, you know, um, hold on. This is going to be a great ride. And uh, we'll do our best to uh, answer the questions that you have. So, Mark, uh, it's all yours. All right. Well, thank you again. And I want to also uh, echo uh, thanks to Hunter Banks and to the Southern Highland Craft Guild and the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation. Uh, great, all three great organizations and uh, the last two, uh, the Guild and the, the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation provide incredible support uh, to enhance the visitor's experience when they're visiting the Blue Ridge Parkway. But it's just good to be with you tonight uh, and looking forward to our discussion over the next hour. Hey, you know, I'd like, I want to add a little bit of context to how Mark, you know, got involved uh, with Wild Bearings and this, this book and the, the webcast and everything. You know, when I, when I did this book, Fly Fishing the Blue Ridge Parkway, I really wanted a, a really good forward to it. And I had several high profile endorsers around the country. I mean, I've got here, TV producers, you know, from ESPN and, and Sports South and a lot of those things, congressmen, uh, fisheries biologists, and even fishing tackle company owners. Uh, but I really wanted someone that was closer to the parkway. You know, it was kind of a parkway pedigree, so to, so to speak. So, so one day I was at the Folk Arts Center in Asheville, and one of the staffers suggested, well, you know, why don't you, why don't you talk to Mark Woods? Um, you know, he, he just retired not long ago and, you know, he, I think he'd be a, a good one to do it. So, um, I thought, Hey, that's a great idea. Who else would be better to write this forward than someone with 38 years of experience with national park curves and someone who had been the Blue Ridge Parkway superintendent from 2013 through 2017, someone who's an avid traveler, a uh, fisherman, a hiker, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, currently resides in Eastern Kentucky, although when he was, I, I think if I've got this right, Mark, when you were actually um, superintendent, you lived, in, did you live in Waynesville? I lived in Asheville for about a year, and then we uh, we moved over to Lake Junaluska, North Carolina. Got it. And um, and so you spent a lot of time, you know, in that area, and of course, your, your, your wife, Jenny, and you have three grown grown children. So, you know, you know, you're just like us, you know, you, you grew up and spent time on the parkway, you, you, you know, you grew to love it, were able to come back and end your career there. So who better to write the forward to this book than Mark Woods? And, and, and Mark graciously agreed to do that. And so that, that's how he got involved with uh, these, these two wild guys, uh, Sam Johnson and Chris, Chris Sloan. Uh, Mark, I'm going to lead out with a question. That when, when we talked about doing this, the first thing that came to mind with me was, you know, growing up, you know, tell us a little bit, you know, where you grew up, um, uh, maybe where you went to school and, and kind of how you got started going to the parkway. All right. Well, I, I'm a native of Greenville, South Carolina, uh, but I grew up in, in a town called Spartanburg, South Carolina, which is uh, called the foothills there in the Carolinas, but I really thought of it as as a town in the shadows of the Blue Ridge because we could we could look out and see in the distance the mountains, and uh, we also had a home on Lake Greenwood. So I 
and naturally as a youngster, I was constantly on the water and fishing and it was just a passion I had and enjoyed. Uh, but one thing that constantly drew drew me were the mountains. And, uh, and while I was in scouting, we there was a Boy Scout camp up near Saluda, North Carolina called Camp Palmetto. And that would be the base of our operations a lot of times. And then we would head out into what you know as the Pisgah District to the Blue Ridge Parkway there on the southern end of the parkway and hit places like Sliding Rock just off the parkway and the, uh, the National Forest there and, and other towns. But I was always drawn, Sam, to, to the parkway, to the really to the area there around Pisgah, Mount Pisgah and that region. And then fast forward a bit when I'm when I married my wife Jenny, uh, ironically her family had ties to to the Waynesville or Haywood County area that go back about a hundred years. So uh, it it was just a, a perfect fit for me. But I always loved those those high elevation mountains, that cold water, and uh, just the rhododendron and laurel, uh, and getting out in in all of that. I really, I really admire how you were able to find a, a life mate in the area that you like to go like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Good it, it for you. Was for sure. And of course, I, you know, I went to a, a college in South Carolina, started at Newberry College and then Lander University. And uh, when, join, when I joined the Park Service, uh, I continued my education with some studies in wildlife management at Texas A&M University, and then some vegetation management studies out at the University of California at Davis. So that's, that's a little about my, my educational background. All right. So Mark, any, uh, any favorite memories of the parkway that, that kind of stick out, you know, from your youth? Did you, did you ever think you'd be uh, par parkway super? You know, I, I really did not expect to, to do that. It, it was interesting. Uh, I, as I said, I was always drawn to what I call the, the Pisgah District, which runs from the Great Smokies, uh, and I'm saying the Pisgah District to the Blue Ridge Parkway, from, from where the parkway uh, ends at the Great Smoky Mountains at the Okona Lefty River all the way back up, you mm -hmm. know, up past Mount Mitchell. And uh, so that area is where, where I would spend a lot of time. But one thing that stands out is a, a, a trip I took with a buddy while I was in high school, two years before I became a seasonal park ranger or a part-time park ranger on, on, with the National Park Service. And we headed up to Mount Pisgah in my Buick Century and his pop-up family's pop-up camper. <laughs> And, uh, you know, nestled into the sites there at Mount Pisgah, uh, had a nice steak and we're planning to, to chase some trout the next day, uh, hit, the, hit the bed and lo and behold, in the middle of the night, uh, we had a, had a visitor. The rangers had been advising all the campers, you know, be sure to put your food up, be sure to store your coolers. But uh, we had a large bear that came through and, uh, was indelibly printed on my mind uh, <laughs> that night. And uh, my buddy and I, we, we, we were laughing about that actually just a couple of months ago, that experience. And little did I know then that one day I'd have the opportunity to work in, on the parkway and, uh, and as the superintendent on the parkway. Mark, I'm, can I, I'm going to go backwards just a moment here. This this uh, vintage photograph from the National Park Service. Can you can you comment on this picture here? This this is a fascinating picture. When you look yeah. at the as you look at the asphalt and this brand new asphalt. <laughs> they don't even have any the, lines. The, the vegetation. There's no lines. <laughs> yeah, the, ve the vegetation hadn't grown up all over the you know the you know, around the side. I exactly. mean, it's just a really cool picture. Yeah, that's a that's a great picture, and and I love it for that reason. And you know, when we talked about a, a image to use, that one was one because of the cars and all that kind of drove me back to my childhood memories and trips up on the parkway. And 
the points you both made are, are really important ones when you get into the management of the parkway today and some of the challenges that are faced like maintaining overlooks and culverts and tunnels and, and everything that goes along with it. But I agree, I love, love that photo. <laughs> a great shot. Uh, Mark, give us a kind of give us the, the IRS short form version of your National Park Service career. I mean, kind of from start to finish. How did how'd you get started with National Forest, a National Park Service? And, and then how'd you end up at, at on the Blue Ridge Parkway? Well, I, uh, you know, I, I started, as I said, a couple of years into college working as a, we used to refer to it as, as 180 day appointments or a seasonal park ranger. You couldn't work for more than 180 days in a, in a year. And uh, I did that in college. And actually at that time had met the, the superintendent of the Blue Ridge Parkway, Mr. Gary Everhart, who unfortunately passed away with COVID. Uh, and, uh, but Gary, uh, met me at the park I was working in, and uh, he, over the course of my career, he he provided, you know, mentoring and guidance, and one thing I always remembered, he always said, the Blue Ridge Parkway is the best job in the entire national park system, and, and <laughs> Gary, Gary had been the director of the National Park Service before moving to the parkway, wow. but, but I started as a seasonal ranger, uh, then left the national parks, went to work with South Carolina State Parks, and then back to the National Park Service in a permanent capacity, uh, working in, uh, in three Revolutionary War parks uh, during that 38-year period you mentioned, uh, presidential uh, home site, uh, Cumberland Island National Seashore, Virgin Islands National Park Group, of course, Cumberland Gap National Historical Park up in Tennessee, Kentucky, and Virginia, where I served the longest. That was a 17-year assignment. And the Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, and I did a little bit of everything, you know, from wildland firefighting all over the country to uh, wildlife management, reintroducing the eastern wild turkey in parks and a variety of other things. And uh law enforcement for about a decade of that time. Um, so it, it was a wonderful career and one that I enjoyed through and through. You, you said something kind of interesting. Uh, it sounds like you at least once uh, went from the National Park Service to a state park. Uh, is that a relatively easy transition? Um, well, you know, two different organizations. Yeah, two different organizations, and while they're similar, a lot of differences too. Uh, the reason I did that is when I was finished college, uh, I needed to have permanent, you know, work that was full time. And uh, at that time, there were there just weren't a lot of positions opening up in the national park. So I I was successful uh, with a position with South Carolina State Parks, and uh, but then shortly after that another job came open and I was able to, to move back to the national parks. So. Got it. That makes, that makes sense. I heard you uh, mention Cumberland Gap. What, what, uh, what, give us a little overview of that. Yeah. Cumberland Gap, for those who've not been there, it's, it's really an amazing uh, smaller park unit. It's located in three States. So the, uh, the primary uh, purpose of the park is to, to uh, protect the, the Cumberland Gap, which was the, the low point in the, in the Cumberland Mountain there that allowed pioneers and settlers, Daniel Boone and many others, uh, to pass through as they headed west. We tend to think St. Louis today is the gateway to the west, but in the uh, 18th century, it really was the Cumberland Gap. And uh, so awesome. I... I uh, transferred to Cumberland Gap from the Virgin Islands in 1997. I'm sorry, yes, 1997. And uh, one of the, the first projects I was involved in was, was an effort to restore the, the landscape at the Cumberland Gap back to its historic appearance. Uh, the park is 
really unique in that, it, you know, you've got a large area managed as wilderness. You've got equestrian trails, hiking trails, backcountry camping, developed front country camping, Civil War fortifications. But one of the historic districts had a main highway that ran through it that carried about 32, uh, I'm sorry, 18,000 cars a day uh, through that historic district. And a director of the Park Service back in the 1950s had, had come up with the idea that, that that road needed to be taken out of the historic district and tunnels built to get the traffic through the mountain and do two things, improve traffic safety and, and, and then allow the Park Service to restore that district back to the way it was when Boone and the others uh, came through. And in 1973, Congress passed legislation directing the Park Service to do just that. Um, so when I arrived at, at the Gap, the tunnels had, had just recently been completed. Um, it, was a, it was a major engineering feat, really, that, uh, that, that ultimately cost about $265 million dollars involved rerouting US Highway 58 and 25E, constructing the two tunnels that are just under a mile long, uh, five miles of new approach roads and interchanges, and then rehabilitating a major cave system that was uh, public guided tours were provided in. Uh, so it, it was really an interesting project, one that I never dreamed I would be involved in anything like that. But the pilot bore for the tunnel took two years to, to bore through the mountain, through Cumberland Mountain, 10 feet uh, wide, 10 feet high, uh, 4,100 feet long. And immediately the engineers found that there were some things they hadn't anticipated. One were springs that could produce produced 450 gallons of water a minute coming out of those pilot bores. Uh, they found uh, voids that were filled with thick clay material and caverns that the tunnel intersected that were as tall as 85 feet and a lake that, that was 30 feet deep, all of this within the mountain. Uh, so the tunnel was completed, traffic opened in 1996, uh, in October of 96. And then we were tasked with the, the task of re rehabilitating or restoring the, the landscape back to its historic appearance. And, uh, you know, that was a fascinating project in that, you know, it involved milling up the old highway through the gap, about 13,000 tons of asphalt was removed. Uh, we moved around 300,000 cubic yards of fill dirt to recreate the grading that would have been originally there before the highway was built. And then the uh, really fun project was about a 10 year, we started a 10 year revegetation effort to plant native grasses, shrubs, and trees. And then one weekend and uh, we had college students come in and plant literally a forest of trees, small trees, of course, but if you go up there today, 20 years later, a, a forest has, has come up, you know, where, where you used to have a U.S. highway. Wow. So today, in essence, today you can, can walk in the footsteps of Daniel Boone and, and all the, the hundreds of thousands of folks who passed through the Cumberland Gap going west. It was it was the largest restoration project of its kind in the National Park Service at the time it was done. Uh, so it was a lot of fun uh, and, an, and a fascinating project. That is fascinating. Mark, the image we're looking at now um, is the, the line of clouds through the middle of, is that the actual gap? That You're looking at Cumberland Mountain and the the clouds closest uh, to you would be the the uh, gap itself, the low point in the mountain. And then if, if the clouds weren't there out in the distance, you would be looking into the Fern Lake watershed. Uh, so you're standing in Virginia 
when you're seeing this image today, which is a prominent overlook in the park, you would be standing in Virginia looking at Tennessee and Kentucky in the distance. And this, wow. is, this is a typical scene early in the morning. The clouds roll from Kentucky into Tennessee, kind of like a waterfall. Wow. It's just beautiful. Now, the, the tunnel tubes themselves would have been past the, past the gap further into yeah, the they're, they're just beyond the first, uh, first area of clouds in, in that high point on the mountain. Uh, Right up in there, yeah. I'll actually be farther back toward towards you. Back okay, right in here. Okay. Further back. Yeah, a little more. Even yeah, right there. Right oh, there. Okay. Right in line. Yeah. Wow. So it's in, you know, it traverses two states, you Kentucky uh and and Tennessee. Wow, that's um that's an amazing project to just to have been a part of. I'm sure that uh it looks good on a resume when you when you've done something like that. Oh wow! That was um, something I what didn't didn't expect to do when I became a park ranger. That's for sure. Well, you've done. I mean, just that project alone is 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 quite a, it, it, it's quite an, an undertaking. Um, so you know, my my question, another question would be, you know, you you worked in some pretty amazing places like this in the national park service uh, why what makes the parkway so unique in your in your eyes well you know before i answer that i'd really like to to give a shout out to the employees on the parkway uh and the volunteers there's a as you know sam and chris there there are, are a lot of volunteers and partner organizations that help get the work done that, uh, that needs to be done to provide that experience along the parkway. So I'd like to shout out to those folks and also to the new superintendent, Tracy Swartout, uh, who has been on the job five months now. Mm -hmm. And uh, she came from Mount Rainier National Park and, and I, I feel like good things will happen under her leadership. But, you know the parkway is recognized uh, throughout the world, really, as an international example of landscape and engineering design achievement. But, you know, it's not the nature and character of the parkway, to me, is what makes it spectacular. And I, and I don't use that word lightly. I mean, around every bend and curve, you know, you're looking at something new and incredible. And it changes, you know, as you drive along, the same place can look totally different uh, from morning to afternoon or from one day to the next. And it took 52 years for the, for the Blue Ridge Parkway to be constructed. It was completed, as you know, in 1987 and uh, the Lenco Viaduct up in the high country, uh, we call it on the parkway. Uh, spanning 469 miles from from Virginia down to North Carolina. Uh, and just to put that in perspective, you know, that'd be like getting in your car mm -hmm. and driving from Asheville, North Carolina to St. Augustine, Florida, and the speed limit's 45 miles an hour and there's no stop sign or red light along, you know, along <laughs> the entire route. So yeah. it, it's phenomenal, really, when you think about it. Uh, and it, as you know, it was built to connect Shenandoah National Park in the north with the Great Smokies to the south. But, you know, it was, it was routed across mountain peaks and rolling pastures and high elevation spruce fir forests. Uh, some summits more than 6,000 feet and the low point up the James River in Virginia at uh, 600 feet above sea level. Um, it was, as, as we know, it was designed to be a, a park that you would ride a little bit and get out and do hiking or fishing or, or, or whatever, picnicking, whatever you enjoyed. And along that route, you have, you know, 12 major uh, recreation areas that, that are large areas, each unique and different in its own right. Uh, but, it, you know, passes through two states, 29 counties six congressional districts, four national forests, uh, 
you've, you're connected to the Cherokee Indian Reservation down on the south end. And just to, again, to, to kind of think about the complexity of the parkway, you have over 1,000 miles of park boundary uh, and 4,000 adjoining landowners. So it it's quite a park. Uh, there, you know, none. There are other parkways, but the park, the Blue Ridge Parkway, is unique and spectacular uh, in its own right. You've got 900 vistas, you know, 151 bridges, 26 tunnels, uh, lodges, lakes, uh, lots of great places to fish. <laughs> it's just it's special, no doubt about it. Mark, I think um, I think it's claimed to be the longest national park in the world. Uh, you know, I'm trying to remember the the Natchez Trace Parkway, and I served there as uh, super acting superintendent for a number of of months, and I'm I'm I can't recall the exact distance on that one, but they're close. Yeah. But it's certainly, you know, it's it's an internationally sought after place to go for for everything from bird watching to fly fishing to, you know, hiking, you name it. People love the parkway. Mark, uh, what, what uh, you know, in, in your tenure there, what any any major challenge that kind of stuck out to you that you had to deal with? Yeah, there, you know, that's funny. I think it's a great, great question, uh, Chris. And to kind of put it in perspective, uh, or to begin with, the, the new superintendent uh, issued a press release back in June of this year uh, reporting that there were 14.1 million visitors to the parkway in 2020. Wow. They spent $1.1 billion, with a B, <laughs> dollars in the communities near the parkway. And I say that because the point I'm going to mention in a minute will have a little more relevance as, as if you think back to these figures. Uh, and the economic impact, the, the cumulative benefit to the local economy was $1.3 billion. So... Uh, you know, people traveling and staying in hotels and eating in restaurants and buying gasoline. I mean, it, it's it's a major industry in its own right. But one of the things, the one of the first things that that I was faced with when I arrived at the Parkway was uh, in 2013 was that one third of all the facilities along the 469 miles of the parkway had been closed, uh, which really, you know, it was, it was discouraging and in particular to not only to the public, but to the staff uh, to see visitor centers closed and campgrounds closed and, you know, picnic facilities closed. Uh, and then to make matters a little more challenging, 10 days after arriving, uh, there was a lapse in federal funding or appropriations. The fiscal year generally starts, it always starts October the 1st, and, and there was no funding uh, made available. Uh, most of our employees were furloughed, sent home, and, and told to, you know, to stay there until notified otherwise. Uh, concession lodges and places like the Pisgah Inn and others were directed to close down as well. And uh, so that was a kind of a double whammy coming in. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you had uh, budget sequestration that reduced the funding made available when it was, when an appropriations bill was passed, uh, which meant we you know, we suddenly had to operate. I think it was just under a million dollars less that we had to, to figure out to how we're going to, you know, manage the parkway with those with those challenges. Uh, and then the deferred maintenance on the parkway is sits at about five hundred uh, million dollars, meaning you know, paving, bridge repairs, those kind of things. So within the first 30 days, those were, were some of the indicators that were staring at me and, and the staff and the partner organizations as well. So that, that was 
uh, that was a challenge. Mm. Wow, that's um, that's a good way to get started, isn't it? <laughs> kind of like you can weather that storm, yeah. the rest of your tenure will be a piece of cake. Exactly. Well, if those were some of the bad things that some of the bad things that that you got had to deal with initially, um, what are some of your favorite? Let's talk about something good. Well, what are some of your favorite places along the parkway? Where are the woods? When you disappear off the radar screen, where do you go? Well, you know, the, one of the first places I was asked to go to and, and did when I arrived in, in 2013 was to, uh, to Otter Lake at the Peaks of Otter uh, Lodge. It was under new management by a new concessionaire. And I think it was week two that I was up there, actually, just before the lapse in appropriations. In fact, I was there when I got the word that we were to close facilities. Uh, we had just had a ribbon cutting to reopen the lodge uh, and, and had a grand event there with the, the community, members of the community in Bedford and the various towns in the area. And uh, so that's that's one place that I, I always enjoyed being would would be the Peaks of Otter Lodge, which is at milepost 86. Uh, so it's a great spot to, to go to. Uh, another would be that I enjoy a lot is and this is not an image of it, but it's just a scene along the parkway. And that's Water Rock Knob. Uh, at milepost 451. I know both of you know it well. It's, uh, you know, it's a very popular spot along the parkway down in, in uh, down on the south end of the parkway. And one reason I think, one reason I love it, I've always loved that spot, but uh, in 2016, we had the good fortune of adding 5,300 acres of land to the parkway. Uh, with the help of uh, conservation trust, land trust that we work very closely with. So that that stands out as a, a special spot uh, for me as well. And one that I could get to, Sam, when I when I just might have, you know, an hour and could get out on the parkway uh, pretty yeah. quickly, I'd go to Water Rock Knob a lot. Uh, you're looking here with the uh, Moses Cone Estate Moses Cone Memorial Park, as it's called, at milepost 294. And it preserves the country estate of Moses Cone, a textile uh, magnet from Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, he called it Flat Top Manor. It's an amazing place. A lot of work has gone into it recently with the help of the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation and uh, give a shout out to them for that. It's a 20 room uh, mansions, 13,000 square feet, built in 1901. And uh, one of the neat things about this area is you've got the Southern Island Craft Guild there, but you also have 25 miles of carriage trails that you can get out on and hike and enjoy. And uh, it's just, a, a, as well as some lakes and you're in a great area out there to trout fish as well, or fly fish. So speaking of, of trout and, and uh, fly fishing, uh, you got you got some uh, favorite fishing spots along the way. You know, can't you can't, you know, people get a little sensitive with hot spotting. Sam can tell you all about that. Yeah, the, the, they do, and and I love that that area of the Parkway. Uh, I know Sam, you've talked about it a lot on some of your other webinars. Uh, but my favorite spot for fishing on the parkway is graveyard fields. Yeah. And the photo, you know, you're looking looking at here. Sam, if I'm remembering in the book, you you give that a five thumbs up, I think, right? I do. Excellent. I do. Uh, excellent. It's, it's not, and, and, and not just because, the, you know, it's loaded with all three species of fish, but it's just it's just an exotic, beautiful place to be, whether you're catching any fish or not. Exactly. And that's one reason I love it. It gives me a feel of being out west somewhere. And yep. uh, 
I don't know. I just I'm always drawn there as as there are many, many people that are that are drawn to graveyard fields as well. But that's probably my favorite spot on the parkway for fly fishing. Um, and uh, that's a, a, a beauty there. That's just a little brook, brook trout that was caught there in graveyard fields uh, on the Yellowstone prong. And there, this was a fall. In fact, this Chris, Chris caught this fish. I took the picture of it, but they're just the most beautiful little animals you can imagine. And it, to just at one time, they were the only ones that were in these streams with the brook trout. No rainbows, no browns. No, that, that's a beauty. I, I agree. I love mm. it. Mm -mm -mm. On the cats. And and this is a this is an image of of where Mark. This is at Price Lake, uh, up in the high country, very close to uh, to the uh, Flat Top Manor, the the home we were looking at earlier. And it's just there's a concession operated uh, boat rental. Uh, on this lake and so if folks are traveling the parkway and if they don't want to get out on some of the streams that are all through that area that you can enjoy fly fishing on and you just want to get out on the lake in a kayak or canoe you can do that here and it's it's just a really nice place to to enjoy the parkway and the scenery is incredible it really is. That's just a beautiful, um, a beautiful area that you got the Boone Fork, you know, feeds into this lake and then exactly. goes, on, it goes on into the Watauga and it's just fishing in the lake or uh, 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 on top of the lake or below the lake. You just got a lot of places to chase trout Yeah, in there. Um, wow. Well, well, Mark, you're not holding anything back on us, are you, on this fishing? You know, that, one reason we wanted to get you on to get you on record uh, was just to, just to try to find out some you know some secrets. Now these are these truly your go to places. Now, I mean we're not going to have to you know waterboard you or anything like that, are you? I, I hope not. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if my back can stand that. <laughs> uh, I think he's I, well. I think, it, it, Mark, you got any other places, or you is that it? Well, there are a lot of other places, but you got you got to get out of the car and and spend some time bushwhacking yeah. or 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 heading up through the streams and or down the streams. The other spot I love is Linville. I, if I I I would place Linville behind Graveyard Fields personally. That's just a, a an area I've always loved, and it probably is because uh, we used to have our in service training, law enforcement training at a little place called Crossnor, which isn't too far away. Mm -hmm. And so me and my buddy that lived up in Roanoke, he loves to fly fish. And, you know, we would, we would get out and ramble all up through this area. But, but those are my, my two, my personal favorite spots along the parkway for fly fishing. Well, let's see, let's see if we can back into this a different direction. Um, you know, you're a hiker, and um, which, what, are, what are some of your favorite places to hike? You know, uh, the beauty of the parkway, as I said, is that it's a ride a while, you know, hike a while, stop a while uh, park. And if you're traveling uh, from the north end to the south, you've got a place five miles down the parkway uh, called Humpback Rocks. And that is an amazing place. It gets a lot of college students that enjoy hiking there. You can see from the picture why. I mean, it's just spectacular. And uh, that's that's a great, great place that I enjoy hiking. Uh, the other one would be back in the area there around Otter Lake, uh, Mount at Peaks of Otter. And there you have... Uh, Sharp Top, Flat Top, and Harkening Hill, three main peaks around the lake uh, or in that area that have just some amazing uh, hiking and a 4,100 acre uh, uh, recreation area there at the Peaks of Otter uh, Lodge. And then, you know, another one that I know you, you know well, both of you know well, would be the Boone Fork Trail at Julian Price Park at milepost 297. And, uh, 
you know, to me, any of those trails, you you really can't go wrong. Uh, there, there are others up and down the parkway that are fantastic too, but those are those would be three that just stand out to me. Excellent. So, so Mark, you know, Sam slides in a kind of a parkway fact with the the, the old tram, right? The the yep. the uh, the the cable car that went across that you know he kind of debated with the. Uh, local historian about this place being there and no, no, no. And then did a little more research and she found pics, right. That are, that are in the, in the book. Um, I you, love you, it too. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. So you, you got a story or, or, or fact that, that most folks probably don't know about. Uh, yeah, you know, it, I would, wouldn't call it a, well, it is a fact, but you know, it, it's, it's a, a story that I like a lot, and it it's uh, in the area there around the, again, where where it all started for me on the parkway near the Pisgah Inn, and that's the Buck Springs Lodge. Uh, it was a, a rustic lodge, and I think we have a photo of it uh, that we can can share with folks, but mm. this, is, this is how it looked in the day. It was a a, a rustic lodge for the Vanderbilts uh, of the famed Biltmore estate. And today it's in ruins. You don't, you don't see this there. You can still see the view from, from the Buck Spring Lodge. But one of the things that, that I had the privilege of doing when I was superintendent on the parkway was spending some time with George Cecil, who was the grandson of George Vanderbilt. And he was just a gentleman, you know, in the truest sense of the word. And uh, he asked me to go up and spend time with him at this site and and just told stories, you know, from his childhood. And out of that, the idea developed the, all the interpretive markers, the educational markers there were pretty much in ruins. They had been vandalized and taken and were gone and uh, but we were able, with the help of the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation, uh, the philanthropic group, to, to pro they provided some funding from, from donors who, working with Mr. Cecil, we were able to, to provide some new interpretive or educational panels. So when folks are wandering around this area, they kind of get a sense of what used to be there. This was their hunting lodge that they would go up and spend time at and of course they owned all the property from the Biltmore estate all the way back up to, to Mount Pisgah just phenomenal mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's kind of a, a a memory I have that I, I I really enjoyed getting to know him and and learning a lot about this place and what it meant to he and his family during those during those days that, that they were there uh, and then a little known fact uh, about uh, something on the parkway would be back at the area where the parkway was completed, the Lynn Cove Viaduct that opened uh, in the 80s. And a lot of folks may not ever think about how that, that viaduct was constructed, but it's a very fragile ecosystem. And uh, a lot of engineering work went into designing that, that uh, platform as you drive out literally like you're out in, in the air, basically, but there are, are 153 precast segments in that superstructure of the Lynn Cove Viaduct at milepost 304. And it's an attraction in its own right. I mean, people go up there just to walk out under it or, or drive out over it, particularly in the fall of the year. And of course it was recognized and reflects, you know, engineering excellence and the design that it has uh, laying light on the land, minimum impact on those rugged slopes uh, yes, at, at, along Grandfather Mountain there. Um, Mark, um, talk to us a moment about the, uh, the Southern, the relationship the Park Service has, the, the, the Blue Ridge Parkway and the Southern Highland Craft Guild. They have, uh, some some of their stores or retail outlets and some of the facilities along the parkway. What what it what is that relationship? Yeah, that you know, I really just stand in in awe uh, at the 
the the ability of the jurors, the members who of the Southern Island Craft Guild, when you look at all the the different media that they use to make, you know, everything from like you, Sam, with your beautiful and amazing bamboo fly rods and pottery and the like. But it, as far as I know, it, it it's still regarded as the oldest craft organization in the nation. And uh, there are about 900 juried members who represent the Appalachian region. You have to live in that region to be juried a member into the, into the guild. But as you said, there, there are uh, the facilities at the Moses Cone Manor and the Folk Art Center on the parkway. And in my mind, they provide a service that the park service simply cannot provide. And that, that's a connection to those traditional crafts of Appalachia. And folks can watch as craftsmen make items as, as we see here. And I think I recognize that fella in that, in that photo. <laughs> Uh, but but the, the Southern Island Craft Guild, uh, to me, is an outstanding partner for the National Park Service, uh, and, and I'm thankful they, they are there and provide service to the visitors and to the public. And, uh, you know, working with Tom Bailey, the, the director of the guild, and the board and the members, uh, it, it was always fascinating to just see the work that they do and and visitors from all over the world would flock to these locations to to experience a little bit of Appalachia and learn something at the same time well Mark um, what can each of us do um, to support the parkway what what now that you're you're you know you you've retired out of the system but looking back in kind of third party you know for the first time in your life um what can we do to help the parkway well you know i often think back to the director of the national park service who the first director of the national park service who commented that establishment of parks is not enough. What is needed are more people who will take the time to stay informed about the issues facing the national parks. And, uh, you know, the, if you go back to the Organic Act, the legislation that Congress passed to create the parks, they, they said the fundamental purpose of these parks is to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein and to provide for the enjoyment of the same in a way that will leave them unimpaired for future generations. So I think if people can really stay informed about what the issues are facing the parks and be proactive in letting your elected officials know, you know, what, what you want to see done in these parks and, and be proactive in being involved, you know, get involved with a group like the the, uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation, and because uh, it really makes a difference. I mean, there were a lot of projects that we never would have seen uh, completion if we had not had a partner agreement with an organization like the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation or the land trust that could come in and negotiate land acquisition uh, and then allow us the time to find the funding to to acquire that property from them or outright donate it to the, to the federal government. Uh, so that it's vitally important. It really has always been that way, but it's more important today, I think, than it ever has been because there's just so much at stake. Right. Well, um, I think that's good counsel. Thank you. Um, I, uh, Chris, I see that we've got a few questions. Uh, yeah, I was just from the I was, audience. Uh, you want to run through a few of those? Yeah, I was just picking up on some of those. Uh, so, Mark, what do you do these days with all your spare time? <laughs> we've got a home in Haywood County, uh, and and as Sam said, we're in eastern Kentucky, southeast Kentucky, most of the time. But I spend a lot of time fishing. Uh, I, I do love fly fishing. I also enjoy uh, fishing ponds and small lakes. Uh, I enjoy hiking a lot, have a couple of friends that I enjoy getting out and doing that with. 
and spending time with our grandchildren. So that keeps me busy. Special. You got a special plug there. I think you got a pretty nice bamboo rod by some guy that that yeah. uh, that made it. How's that thing fishing? That is amazing. Uh, <laughs> I can't I can't say enough about it. It's uh it I've never fished with anything like it. I remember Sam saying, now you've got to use it. You can't just enjoy <laughs> looking at it. It's pretty, it's pretty, but it'll last longer than any graphite or fiberglass rod ever. It's, so. Yeah, it's not a wall, darling. It needs a piece of art. It's just something yeah. to get out on the stream with. And um, the one thing about one thing about that rod, Mark, is whether you catch anything or not, you just you look good, you know, <laughs> fishing a bamboo rod. And so everybody wants to see you a bamboo rod. And the reel you guys recommended, the bat and kill too, is uh, I like it a lot too. Good reel. Yeah, that's, that's a great reel. It looks good on that rod too. It gives uh, between the bamboo and the reel, it gives a nice little extra play at the end uh, to protect that tippet. So a yeah. uh, couple of good products there. Uh, living in Kentucky, uh, do you still visit the parkway? I do. I was there, uh, I think three weeks ago, actually. Uh, but yeah, I get out. I still go to the parkway as often as I can. And, uh, I, I'm anxious to, to do the, the entire drive again. Uh, I, I haven't done that since I retired. I used to do that a lot when I was working on the parkway, but, uh, love to get up there. I get the area I go to the most is obviously in the Haywood County area there, but it's a great place to go. Hey, hey, Mark, do you still have keys to all the gates and everything? <laughs> Just one key to all the gates. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, right. now we need to. Now I know who we need to invite. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was the hardest thing to turn in, Sam. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure it was. I understand the National Forest Service gates are all one key too, all over the yeah, nation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> any uh, since it's October, any uh, any haunted places along the Parkway? Huh. Ah. Uh, uh, so there's a there's an old, I'll call it a lodge, but it's just a big house there at Soco Gap uh, that some people think is haunted, but it's not. But it's that that has always been one of my favorite places. I remember it. Uh, I was so disappointed when I moved to the Parkway because I had remembered that place not too many years earlier being in good condition. Yeah. And that just shows you what can happen, you know, when a little bit of funding isn't made available for something because now the whole roof has collapsed in, unfortunately. But the, you know where I'm talking about? I do. Yeah, I do. You got to imagine Vanderbilt walks the property every now and then, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, if you had it all to do over again, would you do anything different? I would. I would spend more time on the Blue, at the Blue Ridge Parkway. I, I told <laughs> folks I, I wish I could have arrived there 10 years earlier. Uh, I, I, you know, I was... It was it was a wonderful privilege to to work there as the superintendent, uh, and I wouldn't give anything for that. But I, I would love to have been able to be there for ten or fifteen years or twenty six years, you know, like Mister Everhart. Any uh, any good fly fishing tips? Gosh, carry carry your rod with the <laughs> with the. <laughs> The tip facing behind you. I, exactly. Yeah. You, did, you were listening when I told you. Yeah. And remember yeah. that, that trout don't live in ugly places. <laughs> I'll tell you the other thing, too. Make sure your rod is limbered up when you're carrying it and bushwhacking through, or you will lose a tip. Yeah. I, I have to, somewhere down on Graveyard, there is a, uh, there's a tip. So... <laughs> So that definitely happens. Um, it, it takes me a lot longer using that rod to get through the woods than it did with my other one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, cool. Wow. Um, anything, any, anything kind of, uh, that's all the questions that we have. Any, any uh, kind of closing remarks or. I just thank you both for uh, what you're doing. And uh, mm. you know, it, it, it's so important. I remember 
a morning. I, I was out at Otter Lake early one morning, like daybreak, and there was a mist rising over the lake. And I thought, what am I looking at? And there were two little fellas. They must have been seven, eight years old, two brothers, and they were fly fishing right there on the lake. And, nice. you know, and I remember you, Chris, saying, you know, you don't have to spend a fortune, you, you know, do this, do that. And the little guide you have available, uh, give a shout out for that because, uh, you know, it's important to know that. I had a conversation not long ago with our neighbor at Lake Junaluska and she was, I was telling her about all the opportunities for fly fishing and she was saying, really, right here? Well, I didn't know that. Yeah. Or she's lived there, you know, her whole life. And so yeah. what you all are doing is really important because I know you love it and it's fun, but uh, getting others involved, young and old alike, you know, is important, I think. Well, it is, uh, both for fly fishing and for the parkway. Um, they're, they're, you know, one's a hobby and a craft, and the other one is a treasure that, that's, that's worth saving. And the only way we can do that is pass it down to the next generation, because it only takes one generation. That's right. It goes away from it, and it's going to be gone. So, well, um, I see we're close toward the end of our time. You know, uh, on behalf of Wild Bearings, uh, webcast series and Chris Sloan and myself, Sam Johnson. Uh, we just really appreciate Mark Woods, your time sharing with us tonight. I think, uh, I know I've gotten a lot out of it. And I hope the, I hope the audience has. Thank you. Been great. Good to see you, Mark. Always. You too. Let's go fishing. Sounds good. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.